Hi, everybody. Happy Sabbath. We're very glad that you're here, and I hope that you are glad that you're here as well. It was nice to hear you all singing and praising God together. And uh, we did have a wonderful prayer service last night for the people of Ukraine and uh, prayers for peace and, and uh, safety for their loved ones. And we're just, uh, we're, we're hopeful that God, we know God is going to hear those prayers and answer. Amen. Uh, I'm excited to announce that for the next two weeks, my family and I will be on vacation. So don't call me, I won't call you. And uh, we'll, we'll be enjoying time together, some much-needed R&R, uh, ready to come back with energy and, and full, of, uh, full of life. So we, uh, we thank you for letting us get away. You know, we sang a song in our song service called Victory in Jesus. How many of you believe in victory in Jesus? Amen. Amen. Usually when we say victory in Jesus, we're talking about victory over sin. We're talking about victory over this world. But I want to talk about another type of victory today that we haven't been enjoying very much. And that's the victory of the church. I believe that too many churches have gotten used to losing. How does that sit with you? Too many churches have gotten used to losing. What do I mean by losing? I mean, they're not winning souls. The quality of the worship service is blah at best. The ministries have fallen off. They're no longer making a difference in the community. And yet, members can attend church week after week after week in that kind of setting and be okay with it. And I want, I'm here to tell you today that I don't believe that that's okay. If we believe in victory in Jesus, we believe in the victory of the church. Amen? We believe that the church can accomplish its mission. We believe in the promises of God for a church to be effective in reaching its community and winning souls for Christ. We have to believe it. The Bible's full of those promises. And yes, today you're going to hear a little bit about competition. But I believe, and so often Christians shy away from the idea of competition. Friends, we are at war with the devil. We are at war with death and decay and sorrow and sadness. And churches have gotten used to losing. It's time that that ends. It's time that the church rose up to be victorious again. Let's pray one more time before we get into our message. Father, please join us now. Send us your Holy Spirit. Help us to see just how important it is that the church win and get used to winning and expect to win. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that know me a little bit, you know that I grew up playing sports. I grew up playing baseball, Little League all the way through college, had a major league tryout with the Baltimore Orioles, never played on Sabbath. It was always my opportunity to learn how to share my faith with people that were not Adventists. I was surrounded by people that were always wondering, who's this weird kid that doesn't play on Saturday? And so, and even though I, I advanced in my sport, I still to this day will say that I got more out of my stand for my faith than I actually did out of the sport itself. I got more out of sharing why I didn't play on Sabbath, and it made me the person that I am. I got a lot more out of that than actually playing the sport, even though I did get a lot out of that too. And so, because I grew up playing sports, I was surrounded by a lot of alpha males. <laughs> a lot of coaches. My father, an ex-Marine, high school coaches, little league coaches. And in, in the day when I was playing, it was full of alpha males. It was that strong leader of a coach. That's what I got used to and what I would respond to. And so if you see that come out of me occasionally, you know why. It's what I grew up with. And to this day, I, I still gain inspiration from athletes and coaches. A quote will come out now and then that I'll, I'll just latch on to and I'll love. 
some funny, some inspirational, some motivational. I'll never forget this one. Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant when he was still alive, uh, after his career, just after he retired, uh, one of the uh, a reporter asked him this question. If, if you, now at 38, could tell your 19-year-old self one thing, what would it be? What do you think he said? What do you think Kobe Bryant's answer was? What would 38-year-old Kobe Bryant tell 19-year-old Kobe Bryant? Do you know what he said? Stretch. <laughs> Stretch. Now, those of you who are getting older, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? I'm starting to feel that myself, too, and I'm realizing I need to do more stretching. But those, some of you are Tom Brady fans. I will never be because I'm a diehard Buffalo Bills fan, and he gave us too much pain for too many years. But his longevity is attributed to the fact that he believes in pliability. He believes in hydrating his muscles, making sure that his muscles are flexible so that when you get tackled, it doesn't hurt. You know, the older you get, the stiffer you get. You go down to the ground and you're not pliable and it hurts you. We need pliability as we age. So there's something to that. There's a reason that guys played NFL football over the age of 40. There's something to it. And by the way, it goes right along with what Adventists claim we believe. Although he's drinking water and we're eating sodium burgers. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I said it. Other, other quotes over the years. Wayne Gretzky is famous for saying, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. In other words, take the shot, miss or, make or miss. You miss 100% of the shots you don't make. LeBron James said something similar. Don't be afraid of failure. This is the way to succeed. In other words, you have to take risks. You have to try new things. You have to be willing to fail. One of my heroes, not only because he took my team to four straight Super Bowls, but because the man he became after those Super Bowls, Jim Kelly, the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. They all say, all of those teams, those players will say they would never change one thing even though they lost four straight Super Bowls because it changed them as men. Many of them became Christians after that journey. If you ever have the chance, you have Disney Plus or you have ESPN Maybe it's on demand, Third, the 30 for 30 called The Four Falls of Buffalo, I recommend it. You will become a Bills fan, I guarantee you, because the men that they became even after losing four Super Bowls in a row. Not just that, but Jim Kelly, his, his son was born with a very rare disease. He only lived to the age of 14 and he defied the odds. He, he lived much older than anybody expected him to. He never spoke a word. He never could eat food on his own but yet he was his father's inspiration. Jim Kelly in recent years has battled cancer himself, life-threatening cancer of the jaw. So he's famous for many quotes, and recently he was honored because of his fight and because of his life story. And this was what he said, make a difference in the life of someone today who is fighting for their tomorrow. Inspiration coming from people who are alpha males. And their hearts are sometimes touched and they, they lead and they make a difference. And along with that same team, just this week, the, the head coach now of the Buffalo Bills, my favorite team, Sean McDermott, he said this, I recently attended a children's football game. After the game, I heard one of the coaches telling his team that they're going to have to get used to losing. I don't agree with that at all. You should never get used to losing. Friends, probably what that coach was saying was, it's part of life. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But I agree with that sentiment. We should never get used to losing, and especially when it comes to the church. We have gotten used to going through the motions. We've gotten used to subpar programs, if we have programs at all. We've gotten used to a lack of planning and a lack of organization and a lack of thinking ahead and a lack of true investment. I'm not just talking, when I say we, I'm not just talking about Port Charlotte. I'm talking about churches in general. There's way too much apathy, way too much 
getting used to going through the motions and not realizing how badly it's decaying in its success in our communities and for our mission for Jesus. The church should never, ever get used to losing. Jesus says this, and by the way, some of you say, oh, there's too much sports in this, Pastor. There's too much competition. Wait until I take you through some of these verses. The Bible is full of competitive quotes. Full of it. Let me take you to one where Jesus speaks of something similar, though. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21 first. Matthew chapter 21, and beginning in verse 18. Matthew 21, 18. Matthew 21 and verse 18. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree on the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. If you read the book, The Desire of Ages, she makes it very clear that this was the time of year when fig trees were supposed to have figs on them. And for some reason, this tree does not have any figs on it. And see in the fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And the disciples saw it and they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have no faith, if you have faith, and you do not doubt, you will not only do what you have seen due to the fig tree, but even you say that to the mountain, be taken up, thrown into the sea, and it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Friends, the fig tree was not producing fruit. And the reason that Jesus knew that it would be cursed and it would die is because it was a time of year when it was supposed to have fruit. And if it didn't have fruit in that moment, at that time, it meant that tree was dying. So Jesus pronounced a curse that was already taking place to that tree. How many of our churches aren't producing fruit? We, we have all these excuses. We, oh, we, we live in a rural t part, of, part of the world. Oh, we, you know, we don't have a lot of money. Oh, our facilities, all this, all that. Our God is the king of the universe. And the church is made up of all of us. And by the way, the fig tree in this context represents you and me, believers and Christians. We are to be producing good fruit for Christ. If Jesus were to come to us and try to pick some fruit that he would eat from, and by the way, the kind of thing that Jesus eats, and we've seen this in other parts of the Gospels, the, the food that Jesus eats is ministering and soul winning. Feeding him means feeding his lambs. So if Jesus came up to you, a fig tree, and he tried to eat that kind of fruit off from you, are you producing any food for Jesus? Would Jesus come up to you and try to eat things that sustain him? And would he starve? Sadly, I think for many of our churches across the North American division, Jesus can't eat from those churches because there's nothing spiritual there for him to eat. But we come and we worship every Sabbath. But we come and we do this and we go through the motions. That's not spiritual food. And that's not victory for the church. That's just sustaining. It's just being mediocre. And God has never, ever said that his church should ever just exist. We are the church triumphant. We are the church victorious. And it's time that we got used to winning again. Do you believe that today? And before you say, oh, pastor, you shouldn't talk about winning and losing. That's not what it's about. I call baloney. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 13 says this. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never at the bottom. 
Does that sound like competition to you, yes or no? It does to me. It means don't be a loser. Friends, think about this. Too many of our churches are losers. And they're not losers because they lack power or they lack the gospel. It's because too many of its members are spiritual losers. <gasps> Did pastor just call me a loser? Here's the thing. When we think of losers in life, you know, we think of the down and out. I'm a loser. I don't have any talents. I don't have any gifts. I'm not athletic. I'm not good looking. I never succeed. I never do this. I never do that. Friends, in Jesus, there are no losers. We have been made by the King of kings and Lord of lords. We have been sustained by the King of, Lord, King of kings and Lords of, Lord of lords. We have been redeemed and restored. The, our Father is, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There is no resource that it's not at our disposal. So do you know what makes spiritual losers? Bad spiritual attitudes. A lack of willingness to be a winner. Apathy. Not caring enough. That is what makes losers in Christianity. It's a choice. It's a choice. We allow our churches to get into those states. We allow our spiritual lives because things are hard or things get uncomfortable. But friends, we can't get used to losing. Another one, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But thanks be to God who always leads us in a triumphal procession. He's, he's talking here in the Roman culture where there would be literal parades when kings would come back triumphant from battle. And, and here's the wonderful thing. It says that God, Christ, leads us in the spiritual procession. That means we return home victorious with our king leading the way. Amen? But we're in the procession because he's already won the victory. That makes us winners. That means there's nothing too great, no battle, no competition too great that our Lord hasn't already won. Another passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Only one receives the prize. Run the race to obtain the prize. Run to win. And we're not just talking about winning and getting to heaven. Winning the race as a Christian is producing good fruit. And if we're being led in a triumphal procession, Christ has already won the battles that it takes for us to produce good fruit. So not winning the race means we're not trying. We're not trying. And our churches have gotten used to not trying. There's many reasons why churches don't try. Let me finish this verse first. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we are an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. Listen. He's talking about being in a boxing match. And he's saying, I'm not punching at the air. Who is he punching at? He's punching at the kingdom of darkness. He's saying, look, we are in a warfare. Don't swing your fists swinging at nothing. Swing at the enemy. And this, this you know, uh, exercising... What did I read there? But one receives the prize that they may obtain it. The, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Friends, I think the new uh, modesty and the new self-control is also dedication to the mission of the church. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons why so many churches are losing today 
because people don't put in the time anymore. They don't prioritize the victory of the church. Everything else has become more important. And I'm not just talking about church attendance. Church attendance is one aspect of knowing that a church is, is winning. But it's not the only one. If you have a full church, but it's not growing and gathering new people, it's not a victorious church. We're just existing for the sake of having a good time with each other. A victorious church is one that's, that's soul winning. So yes, self-control in all things, because there's so many distractions and worldly things that could take up our time. But self-control means I need to discipline myself to be in action with the mission of Christ and His church on a regular basis. To be on a good team, you've got to be with your team in practice, amen? You've got to put in the time. So many churches, are, they just, we're not doing that anymore. We're not putting in the time together anymore. We, we don't prioritize it anymore. We need to discipline ourselves again to win like Paul says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest that after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. In other words, he's saying as a preacher, he's got to do things to make sure that he stays in the faith. The, the, the point is that there is a discipline that all of us have to incorporate into our lives that keeps us winning these battles. And for the church to win, we need that dedication and discipline. It has to be part of our walk. You know, before the pandemic, only 47% of people reported ever attending church. And that number is decreasing year after year. So 47% of people reported church attendance before the pandemic. During the pandemic, do you know what happened? Giving across the board rose. Thank you for your dedication. Churches experienced giving and increased like never before across the board. But you know what happened to attendance. You know what happened to attendance. And for some of us, that was a safety thing. We understand that. We totally understand that. That's why we upped our game with live stream. And it's nice to see our church filling up more and more, after we, more and more every week, week after week. Praise God that you're coming back. Here's what's happening, though. Too many of our members got used to sitting home and watching church in their pajamas. Churches are having an awful time getting people back. Now, some people still are very vulnerable, and we understand that as well. But other people, they just got used to the comfort of turning on the TV and watching church. Here's the thing, though, friends. The devil's intention is to separate us. He wants to spread us out because we're less effective. He wants to keep us separate from each other. He wants to keep us home by ourselves, soaking in spiritual blessings. So we feel the spiritual blessing, but how far does it go? No further than our, the doors of our house. That's what he wants to have happen to us. He wants us to soak in the blessing, but that's as far as it goes. Because he knows that for us to be a healthy tree, we have to produce fruit that others can feed off from. That's truly healthy. You know, there are certain plants that can soak in all the nutrients, but they never produce the fruit. That We don't want that to be us. That's not a functional plant. We want to produce the fruit that others can eat off from because when others eat off from our fruit, that means Jesus thrives. That means Jesus eats that fruit and he's encouraged. Churches are having an awful time getting people back. We need the family back together. There's another famous statistic that says that only 20% of people who attend church are actually active in ministry. So you have 20% of the people doing 100% of the work. The 80-20 principle. 20% of the people doing 100% of the work. And I want to testify to something else. The pandemic did not stop this church. It kept going. But when the church kept going, and there was less of us here, that means less than 20% of the people were doing 100% of the work. I want to tell you something. If there isn't a name on a ministry or something that gets done, Diane or Sandy or Candy probably did it. Yeah. 
Many of us know the names of the things that got done, but there were so many other things that didn't have a name attached to it. And those three people did it. We have others as well, but just a handful. We have LaDonna. We have some of our deacons. But as far as the way that this thing kept going, it was far, far less than 20%. We started some new things as well over the pandemic. Isn't that good news? And I'm going to talk about some of those new things and why that was here in just a minute. But I bring this up only to tell you that when a church is functioning with the 80-20 principle, that means 20% of people are doing 100% of the work. That's not a functional church. That's not a functional tree for Jesus. Most churches are functioning that way, many of them with less than 20% of the people active. Are you an active Christian? Are you active in ministry? Here's an easy one. Are you ready? One of the things that is so absolutely vital to the health of a church is potluck. And I'm going to get on you right now, okay? I'm going to. For weeks! We've been asking you, somebody please organize our potlucks. Candy's gone. She did that. Above and beyond. Nobody's come forward. Everybody likes to eat, but nobody likes to coordinate. You want the church to win? Volunteer. We need it. We need to eat together. We need to celebrate together. We've got to have somebody coordinate the potluck. Are we still friends? Can I talk straight to you? Somebody's got to do it. It has to be done. So here's, here's, here's what happens from the front. We make appeals because we don't want to have to go knock on your door. And if we make an appeal from the front, it's probably because we've racked our brain about who possibly could do it and we just can't come up with the name. Please, if we put out an appeal in the bulletin, Please just volunteer. It will make our lives, the staff, so much easier. Please, please, please. I'm begging you. It will make our lives so much easier if when we call for a volunteer, someone actually volunteers. The church didn't stop. We kept going. And I want to thank the, the staff, particularly. I want, to I want to thank Diane and Sandy and Candy and Pastor Art. I want to thank LaDonna. I want to thank Pastor Jaime. We kept it going. And now we're opening back up. It's time to keep winning. And I say keep winning because we're already winning. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. We're winning in a way this church has never won before. Did you know that? We'll talk about that here in just a second. It's time for churches across North America to get used to winning. We cannot accept complacency. We cannot accept being mediocre. We are the church of Christ. He's our king of kings. He's our leader. He's our shepherd. He's our victor. He's our God. There's no reason the church should lose. We should not be losers. We should be winners. We should be winners. And to be winners, it takes all of us. Just like a team. You can't have a football team that wins on one person or two or even 20%. It's got to be the whole team. Baseball team. Teams win because they come together. And they win together. Amen? And this is beginning to happen. This is beginning to happen. We have people who have stepped up in ways that have been needed for a long time. We have ministries that are beginning. We have people looking toward our buildings and grounds. Something happens to churches. Sometimes we even forget about our physical plant, too. You just go there week after week after week and something begins to happen and the thing, the thing starts to kind of decay a little bit at a time and you get used to it because you're here every week. I am so thankful 
that Wave has stepped up to be our buildings and grounds, our building administrator, and also our elder and a Sabbath school teacher. Because now he's the guy that walks around and goes, okay, well, that looks bad. I wonder how long that's looked bad. How often we as a church can just go into that church building and walk by that thing that looks bad and get used to it looking bad. That's not a victorious church. The place needs to look good for, for visitors who come in. Do you believe that? That's why we put sign, new signs in. Guys, we had a sign that looked like it was from 1965. And do you know who put the, the letters up there? Pastor Art! He physically would climb up on a ladder, you know, put the W and the E and the L. Pastor Art did that. We, we changed the signs. We were bringing things into the 20th century. Not, not, not even the 21st century, but the 20th century. We want to spruce it up. The deacons worked hard. People like Resty and the deacons and, and, and Kenrick and, and others came together and we worked on the grounds. We spruced it up. Obviously, don't feel bad if I forget a name today. Don't feel bad. I can't think of every single name. It's not intentional, believe me. But I'm trying to encourage us because we're seeing signs. We spruced it up for the community to see that we're doing something. We, we instituted greeters. Not that you didn't have greeters, but greeters became a ministry, amen? Did you know, I believe, if I had to choose the top five most important positions in the church, greeters would be on that list. Did you know that when visitors come to a church, they make a decision about whether or not they are going to return within the first five minutes? In other words, they come in, are they greeted warmly? Do they feel like they belong? They sit down and they look around and they go, this place is a dump. I'm not saying our church. I'm just saying, you know, this place is nice or this place is a dump. If the place is a dump, they go, well, the people that worship here don't care enough about their own church. Why would I care about this church? You with me? If the place doesn't look like the, the members care about it, why would they care about it? Greeters are so important. That's why, you know, I'm so thankful that Andrea and others have stepped up and Susie to make this thing really, really run well. We have a welcome desk and we have pew cards. Those pew cards, and I was going to mention this earlier, but listen, I said we're winning in a way we've never won before. This church has only had one year in its existence where it had around 20 baptisms. And that's when Ron Halverson was here. So he had a Ron Halverson meeting. Everybody goes, oh, wonderful. Ron Halverson, he was a great preacher, right? Guess what? We beat that number. In the last 12-month period, we've beat that number. We're on to 30 and going over 30 because of the people that are preparing. We're winning in a way that's never been won here before. For Jesus. Because you all are catching this vision. That we don't want to lose. We don't want to be mediocre. We don't want to continue to just go through the motions. We want to step up and do ministries, but we got to keep going. We've got to keep going. This church belongs in, 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 in fame and lore. Because you're all good people and you care. But sometimes we let things get too lax and too mediocre and it's time to win again. It's time to continue to win. Deaconesses are extremely important. You know, I remember, and, and deacons as well, I remember a time when it was an honor to be a deacon in the church. Remember those days? Because when the nominating committee called you to be a deacon, you said, the church recognizes me as a spiritual leader. When the nominating committee calls deacons now, people go, oh, great. Now, that's the fault not only of how people see the position, but it's also the fault of the church. I'm not talking about Port Charlotte. I'm just talking about the church in general. That's because we've made the office of deacon reduced to 
somebody that mows the lawn. The position of deacon is a position of spiritual leadership. That's what it is biblically. And while you may take care of the buildings and grounds, and you might help Wave, who is sort of is our, our buildings and grounds administrator, you are vital. Because when a new person comes in here, if things are disorganized and things aren't taken care of and there's cobwebs in the corners, people aren't going to want to be here. So when deacons and deaconesses, they minister to people, they minister to visitors and make people, sure people feel welcome. When, when, when the deaconesses call the shut-ins and bring food to people that are sick, it means something. It means the church is winning. It's a spiritual position in the church. Do you believe that? We need to reclaim what it means to be a deacon. And for our kids, when they look at the deacons of the church, they don't need to say, well, that's just a glorified maintenance man. No. Our kids need to recognize that when the deacons are knocking down the cobwebs out of the corner, that means they love Jesus. That means they, they honor their church and, and they're dedicated to it. That means they care enough to be a spiritual leader. Our kids need to honor our deacons. And they, wanna, they need to want to long to be a deacon. Realizing that, friends, there's no hierarchy. And that brings me to elders. The elders aren't more holy than deacons. They just have different ministry sets. And those of you who have met with me in, in, in elders meetings, you know that I consider elders to be associate pastors of this church. And, and I, I want to make that appeal to you again. If you're an elder of this church, that's how you're viewed by the senior pastor. And I want to challenge you. Are you fulfilling that role? Are you taking it that seriously? And I know elders who are. And I know elders who care. But that's so vital because two pastors of a church of 660 members can't shepherd everybody. We can't shepherd everybody. We need to be able to shepherd each other. Children's ministries. Friends, this, this church has a children's ministries that most churches don't have. Donna Judy and her team are incredible. And that's not even mentioning our pathfinders and our adventurers who do so, so well as well. They do so much. But, you know, our kids jam once a quarter and, and all the things that she does. And pray for Donna. She's struggling with some health issues right now. We need her back. But let me say this. Don't leave it to Donna to do herself. And Joe and Debbie help Donna quite a bit. Don't leave, she needs more help. Look at the potential there that's with our children's ministries. Let's keep it going. Let's keep winning. Church clerk. Adele has served this church how many years as church clerk? 29 years as a church clerk. Hallelujah. Thank you, Adele. <laughs> We're thankful for you. 29 years as a church clerk. Friends, we talked about how important it is for the deacons to do what they do. It's also important that our, our clerk and our church board function in an orderly way. Have you ever been on a church board where nobody seems to have any idea what's going on? What the minutes were from last... Friends, this is about becoming organized. That, that the church clerk and the church board are so important. We should never be at a point where we can't fill a quorum. Because it's so important that we are, are orderly and organized and, and we know where we're headed and know where we're going. That's my goal for this, for this church. I believe in, in planning and strategy and prayerful reasons for why we do what we do. Hopefully you've seen there's intentionality in, in, in my leadership here at this church. I believe in, in prayerfully strategizing where we're going and how we need to get there. What you see from the pulpit, there's intentionality here. One message 
leads to the next. There's, there's intentionality there. There's intentionality in, in the strategic plan that we've, that we've uh, worked on together. There's a reason why Laura has worked so hard on the, the website and the, the newsletter. Because we need to communicate with each other to be one family. Amen? It's time the church continued to win. We need to continue to win. We need to be an inspiration to others about what it looks like to have a victorious church. You can't have a victorious church without prayer. We have a prayer ministry. The Brooks lead our prayer ministry. We need more prayer happening. We need all of you meeting together at some point in, in, in your homes and things, praying and nurturing and loving on each other. That's a victorious church. If we're going to be a church who wins, it means all of us reviving what works, doing other things new, and even trying some things that might fail. That's what it means. Trying some things that might fail, but even those failures will be the Lord steering us into something different. You believe that? Now, there's a method to my madness up here today. Pausing for awkwardness. It's nominating committee time. It's nominating committee time. And not only was this a message to show us how we can be victorious, but it's a message to encourage you that I care about this church winning. And we are looking for people to fill positions who also care about this church winning. We've tried to pare down the list of positions that the nominating committee has to fill to the most important ones. I value your time. I'm hoping that you'll be willing to serve for those of you whose names have been have been listed. And then when it comes time to fill positions, friends, we want victorious ministries in this church. Christ has given us everything we need in order to be victorious. And you have a pastor who is passionate about this church winning. I didn't come to this church just simply to have us go through the motions. I want us to win. And I mentioned names, and I'm sure I didn't mention all the names that I should have today. And if I missed you, I apologize. But the point of this is, is that people are stepping up. They see this vision. They see that we can be victorious, but we need more people. We need more people involved. We need more people impassioned to be victorious in Jesus. There is no reason why the Port Charlotte Church should not be a victorious church. There's no reason why any church shouldn't be victorious. But I know some of you. I know how much you love Jesus. And there is no reason why this church shouldn't be a victorious church for Jesus. We're already seeing it. 30 new baptisms and professions of faith in the last calendar year and more every day are making decisions. You're seeing it happen. What happens if that 30 becomes 60 and that 60 becomes 120? There's no reason why it can't happen here. We can do this together because Jesus has been victorious and He leads us in the victory parade. He goes before us. Friends, if God's church isn't winning, does it mean it's because there's a shortage of the Holy Spirit? No, if God's church isn't winning, does it mean that there's a shortage of God wanting us to win souls? No. Does it mean that there's a shortage in God's power or the power in the Word? No. Does it mean that there's no longer a need for hope in the world? No. Does it mean that people no longer need Jesus? No. If God's church isn't winning, who is responsible? We are. It's time the church started winning again. And it's on you and it's on me. Let's have a victorious church in Port Charlotte. Thank you so much if you're serving.
but we need everybody. We need everybody. It's time, Port Charlotte Church, be a victorious church. Amen.